friend on Facebook um, asked me if I would respond to a question. If you believe that all people are predestined for heaven or hell, why bother sharing the gospel? That's a very common question. That's a very good question. Um, the error behind the question is the idea that um, believing that, pre that people are predestined um, unto salvation. Obviously, no one needs to be predestined to hell because everyone's already in sin, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Johnson here already pointed out in his response. Um, but the fact of the matter is God does not just determine the final outcome. God's sovereignty and his sovereign decree, he does not just determine the final outcome. He determines also every single minute individual step towards those outcomes. The means by which God calls his elect to faith in Jesus Christ is the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. Now you see this illustrated really well in uh, Acts 13, uh, 48, uh, which is a, a passage I would certainly invite some of his uh, respondents here on this Facebook uh, uh, page here, especially Mark Johnson, uh, to answer. Um, Acts 13, 48 uh, says, Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. We are the tools in the hands of God for the accomplishment of his purposes. We do not argue people or even evangelize people into the kingdom of God. We are given the sacred task and the, the honor of sharing the gospel with people, of proclaiming the good news, which is not Jesus love you, loves you and died for you. The gospel message is that Christ died for sinners. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And now God's call goes out to the world. Repent and believe. The gospel is imperatives. It is a command. Repent and believe. And God uses our proclamation of Christ and him crucified uh, to make alive the dead sinner who will then, by the effectual grace and power of God, uh, come to Jesus Christ and be saved. So God does not decree only the final outcome. He decrees every single step towards that outcome. And that's what the what is fundamentally missing uh, and so many critics of Reformed theology, they think, well, if God's already determined the way it's all going to turn out, why share the gospel at all? Uh, because the, the the way it's all going to turn out is not the only thing God has decreed and determined. God has decreed and determined to use our prayers. In fact, it is the greatest motivation to prayer that I know of. I know that the God of heaven and earth who created all things decreed that in that very moment, I would bow my head and have a burden to pray for the salvation of this person and that person and my children and to pray that God would, would bless my proclamation of the word to the church here. The sovereign decree of God is the very thing that gives animation to our prayers. It's the very thing that, that motivates evangelism. I am confident that when the opportunities are there to be a witness for Christ and to, to proclaim the gospel and to, to command people to repent and believe, that God has decreed all those things, and he will make use uh, of what we're doing. Uh, and so far from uh, being a hindrance to evangelism, the fact that people are predestined for heaven um, is the only reason to do evangelism. Um, if I didn't believe in sovereign election, didn't believe in predestination, I wouldn't be sharing the gospel with anybody. If I thought that it depended on my ability to reason with people or my ability to be, to be whatever, to make them flick the, uh, the free will switch in their brain, uh, I wouldn't be engaged in evangelism. It's only because I believe in the sovereignty of God that I do evangelism. So that's the, to me, that question is just really odd. If you believe uh, all people are predestined for heaven or hell, why bother sharing the gospel? Because the means by which God calls his elect uh, to faith in Christ is the proclamation of that gospel. Um, what I've always encouraged people to have the mindset of, since we don't know who the elect are, except in terms of who repents and who comes to Christ, just like Acts 13, 48, Acts 13, 48 says, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. So, so who, who comes to Christ, who believes in Christ? It will be his elect. And God, in his own timing, and his own sovereign decree, uh, will send ministers of the gospel uh, to his elect people, and they will proclaim it to those people, and God will effectually call those people. Um, the, the sovereign decree of election, God's having chosen by name individually every single person that he intends to save, guarantees that those people will have faith and come to Jesus Christ. Jesus teaches this very, very clearly in John 6, 37. He says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Will come to me. Every single individual person 
that was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, given to the Son by the Father, will come to Christ. The sovereign decree of election guarantees faith. We are predestined unto adoption as sons. I actually had a, an Arminian guy tell me one time that in Ephesians chapter 1, where it says that he predestined us unto adoption, well, that doesn't mean he predestined us to faith. I just think, so you can be adopted as a child of God and not have faith? Uh, I think the one entails the other. If we've been predestined by God to adoption, then we've been predestined to believe the gospel. Because only those who believe the gospel will be adopted by God as his children. And so God decrees the final outcome and God decrees the means to those ends. And there's a lot more uh, biblical material that goes into this. In fact, I pulled up the manuscripts of five sermons I preached on this. And I was like, I don't think everyone wants to, to listen, sit here for six hours and listen to me read my manuscripts here. But um, it's very important that people understand that Reformed people, really just biblical Christians, were not saying that God only decrees the final outcome, therefore what we do doesn't matter. What we're saying is he determines everything, and therefore everything we do matters. Everything we do is important to the accomplishment of God's purposes. Um, you know, God has always made use of means. Let me ask this question. When Joseph was uh, sold off into Egyptian slavery, um, at the end of his life, when he was reunited with his family there in Genesis 45 and 47 and Genesis 50, he recognized the hand of God in sending him down into Egypt. He, he, he could see it. And in fact, that's really what helped Joseph cope with the incredible hardship that he had uh, endured for about 13 years. I mean, he was sold away from his family. He listened to his own brothers talking about murdering him. Um, they, they heard his anguished cries, it says in, in the book of, I think it's in Hebrews. And they didn't care. They just sold him off into slavery. Then he was unjustly imprisoned because of the episode with Potiphar's wife. I mean, he suffered tremendously. And yet, at the end of the day, Joseph, because his view of God was so great, because it was so reformed and biblical, Joseph could see, God sent me here. Yes, brothers, Genesis 50, 50 verse 20, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Now, I want to ask a question. Couldn't God have just gotten Joseph down there into Egypt in some other way than decreeing that his brothers would sin against him in that way? Of course. But that's, now, that's not how we chose to do it. God chose to make use of those secondary means, those evil intentions on the part of his brothers to bring about the saving of the lives of the people of Israel and really the establishment of the nation of Israel. Well, did he, did he have to use sin? No, he could have done it any way he wanted to. But Joseph could see that God had a purpose even in the evil that happened. So God's sovereign decree is not just the final outcome has been determined, but every single step toward that outcome. Uh, it's amazing, the, the early church gathered in prayer in Acts chapter 4, verse 26. They say they, they pray together. And ask yourselves this question. Do you as a Christian pray like this? Listen, the kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined them to do determined before for them to do. Do we ever, do you pray like that? God, thank you that you predestined uh, that my child would repent and come to Christ. Thank you that you predestined this and that to happen. See, now very often people will say, well, okay, we, we believe God predestines, you know, the big things like that. I mean, he predestines the, the, the cross and the exodus and uh, the plagues and the hardening of Pharaoh. So he predestines big things. That doesn't mean he's sovereign over everything. I mean, God has delegated a, a measure of, of independent freedom to us, hasn't he? Uh, and the simple fact is the scripture is very clear and very repetitive in making sure that we understand that God's sovereignty extends to everything that comes to pass. Everything. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, I think it is? Not a single sparrow falls to the ground apart from your father's will. Not a single hair falls off of your head apart from the will of the father. So what are we to believe by that? What, what is he saying? Is he saying that God is sovereign over the deaths of sparrows, but he's not sovereign over the deaths of cardinals and blue jays and eagles and owls and ostriches. He's only sovereign over sparrows. Don't you see the, the, the point? It's an argument from the lesser to the greater. If he's sovereign over something as insignificant as a sparrow, every single death of every single sparrow does not die apart from the Father's will. It, it follows that God is sovereign over everything in life. Uh, including the hairs or lack thereof on someone's head. It, it's, it comforts me to know that in God's providence, I would go bald when I was 28 and it would be very quick and sudden. Every one of those hairs just fell right off and 
As much as my, my six-year-old daughter, every time I, I need to buzz it again, she's like, hey, look, it's starting to grow back. I'm like, uh, no, it's not coming back. But if God is, um, is sovereign over the tiniest little things like that, the point is he's sovereign over everything. His decree encompasses everything. Now, that's repulsive to the natural man. The natural man does not like the idea of God's kingly sovereignty extending, um, be, being that much in control. And yet, it's a very clear teaching of, of Scripture. I may do a, a couple more videos here. I'm just kind of perusing some of my sermon manuscripts here. And uh, uh, God is, is definitely sovereign uh, over ev absolutely everything that comes to pass in time and space. Um, and it's, it's precisely because he's sovereign over everything that we have confidence in evangelism, that I'm willing to go the extra mile with people because I know that God uses the, that as the means. We are born again by the word of God. Think about uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, 20 and following. 20, verse 22 of 1 Peter 1, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Which lives and abides forever. The word of God. What is the means of our being born again? The, the proclamation of the word of God. It's the word of God that makes us born again. So God decrees the final outcome. He predestines his elect unto glory. And we don't believe in double predestination. As uh, my, my friend there, Mr. Johnson, pointed out, there's no need for God to, to have a positive decree of reprobation in the, in the sense of having to create unbelief or, or to exert additional power upon those that he has sovereignly chosen to bypass and leave in their sins, which is exactly what all of them want. None of them want anything to do with God. And in fact, if you ask them, they would say, I want God to leave me alone. I hate him. I don't want anything to do with him. But God predestines his elect unto full and final salvation. Think of Romans uh, 8, 28 uh, through the next few verses. Those whom he foreknew, which means to choose to enter into a rela relationship with beforehand. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, these he also glorified. You see how everything's connected? God does not simply decree the final outcome who's glorified. He determines everything in between as well. Every single step toward that end is part of the process. Our proclamation of the gospel to all men everywhere and then commanding them to repent and believe. That is the means by which God calls his elect to faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what animates evangelism. And I wasn't really all that involved in evangelism before uh, I became a Calvinist. Um, because, frankly, I didn't really see the point. Plus, I also entertained ideas that, well, you know, as long as they exercise their free will and react good enough to the knowledge of God that was revealed to them in creation, you know, I guess they're just as likely to be saved anyway. That's not true, of course. People need to hear the gospel. That's how God calls his elect to faith in Christ. And as I said, I always encourage people to have the mindset that everyone that you know in your life is there because they are one of God's elect. And God is calling you to love them where they are, uh, to, to be in it for the long haul with them, and to talk to them about Jesus, to talk to them about the holiness of God, to ask them the key questions. Do you think that you would go to heaven if you died? And if they give you the wrong answer to, to questions like that, you, sh you preach the gospel to them. The good news is that heaven is a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can't merit it. We are saved by the grace of God through faith alone and Christ alone, apart from works, lest any man should boast, and so on and so forth. And then you go from there. But God does not decree simply the end, who ends up in heaven, who ends up in hell. He decrees every single step towards those ends. Um, and that's why we preach the gospel, because we know that that is uh, the primary means by which God uh, calls his elect to faith in Christ. But also, there's another reason we preach the gospel to people. Jesus told us to. That in and of itself ought to be enough to end the, end the dispute. Jesus said to go do it, so we better go do it. But theologically, logically, um, God's decree does not just include the outcome, it includes every step toward that outcome. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks for watching.